Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope you are having a great week so far. Well, so far, I mean, it's Thursday, so the week is almost over. Maybe I just meant I hope you've been having a great week since we chatted on Tuesday when we uh, had uh, the last episode. Yeah, I I don't know what I'm saying, clearly. So it's Thursday, and I hope it's a great Thursday. Let's just go with that. Hope your week has been going well. If it's spring break for you or your kids, I hope that's going well. It's um, almost Easter, and so that often involves travel for some people. Just, you know, a lot of things going on. The weather is starting to hopefully get nice for you, etc., etc. But we're not here to talk about the weather and we're not here to talk about Easter. We're here to talk about books because it is the book review podcast. And I have an author interview for you today. As I mentioned on Tuesday, today's interview is with author Priscilla Oliveras about the second book in her match to perfection series. It's called her perfect affair. And the description is as follows. Rosa Fernandez does not act on impulse. She's the responsible one, planning her career with precision, finally landing a job as the librarian at Conservative Queen of Peace Academy, and confining her strongest emotions to her secret poetry journal. But she's been harboring a secret crush on dreamy Jeremy Taylor, and after one dance with him at her sister's wedding, Rosa longs to let loose for the first time. She deserves some fun, after all. So what if she doesn't have a shot with Jeremy? Not with his wealthy pedigree and high-profile lifestyle. But one dance leads to one kiss, and soon Rosa is head over heels. That is the description of Her Perfect Affair, the second in the Match to Perfection series. The first book is called His Perfect Partner, and that is about Yasmin and Tomas. Yasmin is the oldest sister in the Fernandez family, so this is a trilogy. Um, Rosa Fernandez, and then the second one this that we're talking about today, Her Perfect Affair, is about... Rosa, and then the third one, which comes out in December, and Priscilla will talk about all of these in the interview, is about the youngest sister, Lily. Um, So there are three books, and then there's a novella also about a Fernandez cousin, and that's also coming out around um, December, sometime in December, because it's in a holiday collection of novellas. So good stuff. If you are, if you find yourself reading this book and find yourself loving the Fernandez family, just know that you've got several opportunities to get to know them better. This is the second in the trilogy, but uh, they are written, uh, Priscilla says they are written as effectively standalone novels. You don't have to have read the first one. And while I have the first one, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. And I don't feel like I, I mean, obviously there's a backstory there and I will go back and read it, but I don't feel like I'm just missing tons of information when I read this second book. It is obviously a romance, as you can tell from the back of the book, the the book description that I just read, a couple of things that I really like about this story. First of all, Rosa is a librarian, and as you know, my dad's a librarian, so that just touches my heart. Yay! Well, I love librarians. Librarians are awesome. I um, actually contemplated becoming a librarian for a while and looked into the Master of Library Sciences degree. It's, um, I don't know, that was a billion and a half years ago. It's probably different now, but I I thought about it for a minute and then I chose a different path. But um, I have a soft spot in my heart for librarians, so I already loved Rosa before I even started reading the book. It's also... um, Priscilla describes her work as romance with a Latinx flair. So as if you couldn't tell from the last name of Fernandez, the Fernandez girls are, um, of, uh, are, are Latina. They're Puerto Rican. 
And so there is a good mixture of uh, some Spanish language thrown in. There's Puerto Rican culture. It's just it's a it's a family who's Puerto Rican, so obviously we get a, um, they live in Chicago, so we get a view into their life, and it's really nice to have um, main characters who are people of color. We so often get so fixated in in every genre of it, you know we don't often have people of color well represented. So it's wonderful when you get characters who represent different cultures, different ethnicities, uh, different stories, different family styles. That's one thing that I really, really appreciated about this book. And I got to um, learn a couple new Spanish phrases. My, my Spanish is deplorable. I know very few things in it, but uh, it's nice to brush up on the few things that I do know and learn a couple of phrases. So as always, I know I always say this, but enough out of me. Let's turn to that interview with um, Priscilla Oliveris. And just as, oh, heads up, it's nothing major, but um, Priscilla was in a kind of noisy location when we were doing our interview. There's really only one time as I was editing that I could hear some stuff in the background. It was while Priscilla was speaking, so I couldn't edit that out. But I listened to it through headphones and it didn't seem distracting to me. So just know that you may hear um, a little bit of noise, uh, another voice in the background. It's not a ghost or anything. No, it's not a podcast ghost. Just a bit of a noisy location, but it shouldn't distract too much and it's very brief. So that's my warning. Let's turn now to the interview with author Priscilla Oliveras about her second book in the Match to Perfection series, Her Perfect Affair. Hi, Priscilla. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. I'm excited as well. It's wonderful to have you here. So we are here to talk about your second book in the Match to Perfection series called The Perfect Her Perfect Affair. But before we get to the books, I would love for my listeners to get to know you a little bit better. So if you could just share a little bit about yourself and your life. Sure. Uh, um, I My name is Priscilla Oliveras. I'm, I'm a Florida girl, um, born and raised though kind of all over because my dad was in the Navy. So we moved around a lot. My mom's from Puerto Rico. My dad is kind of Mexican-American, Tex-Mex from San Antonio, Texas. So we grew up in, in our house kind of a mix of Hispanic, Latino culture and uh, um, military culture and in and, and a wide variety of places. I've been writing for a long, long time. I'm a mom with three grown daughters, so I like to think that that parental experience um, and, and all the time that I've spent writing and, and waiting you know, to sell and to publish has just kind of given me more fodder for my writing. Um, I think if you read my, my bio, it tells you a little bit about me. I'm a huge sports fan. Um, I love to go to the beach. And I am really good at taking naps in our backyard hammock. <laughs> now that sounds awesome. I, I like that plan. So talk about Her Perfect Affair, which, as I said, is the second in the Matched Perfection series. Yes. Her Perfect Affair um, is the story about Lily. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, I've just finished turning in Lily. So Lily's kind of in my brain. So Her Perfect Affair is actually Rose's story. She's the middle sister, and in, in the Match to Perfection series, each of the books features one of the three Fernandez sisters. Book one was Yasmin. Book two is All Roses. But you do, you'll see all three girls. They'll have family dinners together, or they'll be on the phone talking with each other. So you get to see all three girls in, in all of the stories. But Her Perfect Affair is purely Rosa's love story with Jeremy, her hero. And Rosa is my kind of shy librarian, but when she needs to put her foot down and speak up, she does. That's something Jeremy learns right away. Uh, um, she's the reliable one, the one everybody can count on to get things done. And at the very beginning of the story, she's kind of itching to maybe step out of that role or at least to kind of go for something that she's really wanted for a long time. And um, that is to kind of connect with, with Jeremy. And so she she makes a move, and like what can kind of happen to a lot of us in real life, you, you try to go for something or step outside of your comfort zone, and sometimes there's consequences that you didn't anticipate, no matter 
how much you tried to cover all your bases, and, and that's what happens with Rosa and Jeremy. They are kind of they have some consequences that they face together. Um, I think at first in the book, what's going on is they want to face them in different ways. Um, but I really love the way um, Publishers Weekly, in their review, one of the things that they mentioned was they thought it's it's a book about good people uh, trying to make difficult choices, and so that's kind of the gist of Rosa and Jeremy's story. They're both really good people. So honestly, it was kind of hard to write because I love Rosa so much. I didn't want to put conflict in her way. And <laughs> as an author, we kind of know if there's no conflict, then your story is over. Right. And so actually, there was a point where I had to kind of distance myself from how much I care for Rosa as a person and look at it as an author and what do I need to do to make her story better and, and to make it better for readers. Right. But So ultimately, I hope at the end, that um, readers will kind of care, come to care for her as much as I do. And I know we just got started with um, the interview with Priscilla and her description of the book and the series, but it is time to take that first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the main characters, Rosa and Jeremy, and some of the things that they go through and some of their experiences that affect their lives, their relationship, um, and the situation that they find themselves in as they start getting to know each other, becoming a couple, etc. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we'll be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Priscilla Oliveras about her uh, second book in the Match to Perfection trilogy. It's called Her Perfect Affair, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the main characters, Rosa and Jeremy. Rosa and Jeremy are interesting characters in that, I mean, Rosa's pretty much your your very typical middle child. You know, she's kind of the peacekeeper in the family. She doesn't rock the boat too much, etc., until the consequences of that you were just talking about. But she and Jeremy mm -hmm. also have different levels of guilt in their lives that influences mm -hmm. how they react to this situation. So Rosa has um, guilt about her mother's death combined with uh, some Catholic guilt. And Jeremy has guilt about his parentage that his father was, um, his biological father was just kind of a horrible human being. And so they, they yeah. both bring that into their relationship. Yeah, I, I think what, what I try to do, and, and oh, I mean, what a lot of authors do is look for what are some universal conflicts, universal feelings that um, we can give our characters so that they will resonate with readers. And I can say as a, a cradle Catholic, I do Catholic guilt very well. So I identified with Rosa in, in that respect. But I think that issue of guilt, and whether it's with our family, whether it's with close friends, whether it's with, with mentors, and when you try to do, sometimes it's not always easy to do what you think is right for someone else, but it, when what might be right for you is something different, and especially with Jeremy, that's kind of what he struggles with, guilt over trying to do, trying to follow a path that was right for him, but but it was a completely different path than his family expected him to or that he assumed they would always expect him to and, and how he dealt with that as, as a young, young man wasn't, wasn't necessarily the right way. Um, and so, yeah, I think what I tried to do with, especially with these two, that, that issue of 
you know, guilt that you carry with maybe when you feel like you don't, you have not lived up to a loved one's expectations. Um, I think that's something that a lot of readers might be able to identify with. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Jeremy and Rosa are also interesting in that they come from very different backgrounds. They come from different, um, different circles in society in Chicago. They Mm -hmm. um, come from different religious backgrounds. They come from different ethnic backgrounds. Can you talk a little bit about the challenge of writing that, that the dynamic between them in terms of their very different backgrounds? As far as the the ethnic background, mostly, um, I don't really know that I have yet tackled that as that that would be an, an issue. I think one of the things that Rosa worried about was coming from different social economic um, circles in that Jeremy's family is in the limelight in Chicago quite a bit. And she's quiet and she's shy and she's used to being in what, what she thinks of as her other two more outgoing sisters' shadows. So that was that was an, an internal conflict for, for Rosa to have to deal with that she saw it as an external conflict, but really it was mostly a hang-up that, that she needed to figure out how she could deal with um, because she does have that concern of will she fit in, will she be looked at um, in, in, in as less than. Um, but honestly, from Jeremy's perspective, that never even enters into his psyche. I, I think that is what makes him hero material is that um, the idea that Rosa would be less than because she comes from middle class, you know, suburbs is not even anything that would enter, you know, on, on his radar. He just views her as a person. Now, for him, he, he one of the reasons his backstory is that he left um, the Chicago area and it's how he wound up meeting Yasmin, the the heroine from book one is when they lived in New York City. But for him, it was to get a, a, away from that limelight and, um, every, you know, being un, being under, um, how could I say, like, you know, people are always wanting to know what he was up to because of his family name. And so, you know, it, it turns out that that's something that they kind of have in common, that Rosa... Uh, um, didn't didn't think about at least in the beginning, and and really I think that's mostly a hang up that that she has to overcome and and, and learn to deal with. Thank you for that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the the series as a whole. The first one is out, and that as you said is about the the older sister Yasmin. Can you talk uh-huh. a little bit about that story? Sure, Yasmin and Tomas. Their story is her. Um, his perfect partner. So the the series goes his perfect partner, her perfect affair, and then book three, which will come out later this year. It's actually a December release. Is their perfect melody, and Yasmin and Thomas's story. I'll say Yasmin was the genesis for the series as a whole. She just came to me as a character, and the more I got to know her, and I learned that she had two sisters and I learned about their relationship with their mommy and papi, their, their mom and dad. I knew that I wanted to tell all of the girls story and I want, I wanted to spend more time with the Fernandez family. So then I hoped that readers would want to as well. But Yasmin is a Broadway dancer and book one, she has come back home because papi um, is dealing with cancer the girl's mom died when they were younger, when Yasmin and Rosa were in high school. Mommy died in a car accident. So it's just the three sisters and their dad, Papi. And Papi has cancer. Yasmin comes back home because Rosa and Lily are in college. That's kind of what she's saying on the surface. But in actuality, she's kind of going through a, a crisis of wondering if this path to stardom on, on the stage is the right one for her. It's one that her whole family um, expects for her because it's something, it's a dream that she's had for a while and her parents made lots of sacrifices for her to be there. So it, again, she knows if she changes her plan, would she be disappointing loved ones and all those who expect her to go and make it big? So she's come back home to take care of Poppy, but she's also come back home internally trying to regain her confidence and and go back to tackle uh, her career as a Broadway dancer and, and make her family proud. But while she's home, she is volunteering at her old dance studio, and she's got a class of 
five and six year olds, and one of her students is Maria, whose father is Tomas, who becomes Yasmin's hero. And so Tomas is a single dad. He's an ad executive in Chicago. He is kicking butt in his in his career, but he's realizing that focusing so much on career is is also hurting the amount of time that he wants to be able to to spend with his daughter. And so the the, the book itself is. There are a lot of family themes, I think mostly because that's important to me and, and my life, so it kind of bleeds into my stories as well. But it's it's a story about two people who, in the beginning, they feel like they're on completely different paths, and they ultimately have to come to a place where hopefully they realize maybe their paths are entwined and, and the perfect person is, is right there for them. Okay, thank you. And then the third book you said comes out in December, and that is about the yeah. youngest sister, Lily. Uh, can you talk a little yeah. bit about that without, you know, giving too much away? <laughs> sure. Um, this um, the last book is Their Perfect Melody, and this is Lily. And we flash forward a few years, and Lily has now graduated from college, and she is working as a victims advocate in Chicago. And kind of the story is about what happens when. The victim's advocate with her rose-colored glasses firmly in place rubs up against a street-smart Chicago cop who has a, a knack for playing classical guitar. And together, they kind of wind up realizing that they might just be able to make perfect music. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you, are, you live currently in Florida. So what went into your decision to set this series in Chicago? Well, when I started the series, I was actually still living in southern Illinois, and but mostly I think I, Chicago is one of my top favorite cities in the U.S. It's kind of rivals. It, it, it's up there with D.C. and New York City, but I, in Chicago, there is a large Puerto Rican population, and so it just, I think it was a combination of I love the city, it was, um, I was living nearby, and I also, I did kind of want them to be near a larger city, um, especially if Yasmin wound up trying to decide to stay and maybe do dance in in that area. So I think it just was a, a combination, really sim- the same way that kind of Yasmin just danced into my imagination. The city of Chicago was just there, and it, it just felt like it was the right place for the girls to be. Okay. So now you know a lot more about the Fernandez sisters and the Fernandez family and this trilogy that is about them, why it's set in Chicago, etc. We are going to take our second break of the podcast, um, but stay tuned. When we come back, I will be asking a very awkward question that I can't figure out how to quite phrase. So you know you want to tune in for the awkwardness. You are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we're just going to go ahead and get back to the interview, the conclusion of the interview with author Priscilla Oliveris. And I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this question because I'm going to sound like a total nerd. <laughs> but, um, oh, no worries. So the, the family, the, the girls are all bilingual. Um, they speak both English and Spanish. And so there's Spanish sprinkled throughout the book, which is fun because it helps me to I, I have very, very rudimentary Spanish. So I get to try to kind of figure out what they're talking about before I, I read 
read on and see what your translation is. Um, as a person who's not bilingual, I assume you write kind of how you would speak maybe with your own family. How, see, this is where I'm trying to figure out, how do you kind of figure out where those those Spanish phrases come into play? You mean like, when will I sprinkle in Spanish? Right. How, is there, okay. is it just sort of natural to the way you write and speak? Or is there a specific reason behind some of it? Or I, I, I like I said, I'm having a weird time mm-hmm. phrasing this question. Oh, no. no, no, that's a great, that's a great question. And, and really, I would say, for me, it, it must, I haven't thought about that. So it's, it's interesting that, that you bring that up. Because honestly, I would probably just say it's, it's how I think. Mm-hmm. When, when I'm with friends that I know speak Spanish, our Spanglish kind of goes back and forth. I will say my abuela used to not like that at all because she only spoke Spanish. So when we would slip into Spanglish in conversation, she could miss part of the part of the conversation. So mm-hmm. it's really important to be aware of who you're who you're speaking with, um, uh, so that you know. But predominantly with my family now and with close girlfriends that, you know, we can go back and forth from English to Spanish. So it's not even really a conscious thing for me. Uh, and so I guess I just, with the sisters, because they are, and, and the same thing in book three, Diego is Puerto Rican, and so he can slip in and out of Spanish. What I do try to try to do is if I use Spanish in my book, now, when I say something in Spanish, I don't automatically repeat it in English because I know what it means. However, I know that there will be readers like you who don't speak Spanish. So I need to have the translation in there, but I, I want it to sound natural so that a reader who is bilingual doesn't, doesn't feel like, why is she repeating this? I already know what she said. Right. So my hope, my hope is that I have done a good enough job in putting the translation in there in a natural way that it's not intrusive to someone who's bilingual, but yet someone who is not bilingual doesn't feel like she's, she or he is missing something. Uh, um, so I, my hope is that I work, that worked for you. <laughs> it did. And uh, that's, I think that's why it caught my attention was because, you know, I would, I would see the Spanish phrases and some of them I could kind of puzzle through myself, but then I, I knew that I wouldn't have to be confused because I knew you would you would bring up the translation somehow in the context of the story. I read a book um, a, a while back, and there was a really important scene that kind of explained everything, and it was entirely in Spanish. <laughs> and so oh. I had absolutely no idea what the heck just happened until oh, no. until they made a movie of it. And my best friend and I went to the movie, and when that scene came, we both said, oh! Oh, really loud! Oh my God, <laughs> that's oh. what happened. Well, yikes! Well, I will I will share with you that my editor did ask me, did we think that we might want to put uh, like a, vo- a, a vocabulary um, vocabulary is not the right, but but some kind of index that mm-hmm. listed like the Spanish glossary. words and put them in English. Yeah, like a glossary. My fear was that if someone saw that, that then they might think, oh gosh, there's a lot of Spanish in here. I better not read this book. It's going to confuse me. So I'm not really sure. I think that's something that I would want to ask readers. Would they have benefited had there been a glossary or do I do an okay job and do I do an an okay job and they follow along well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I followed along, so I thought you did an okay job, but I can't speak for other readers, of course. You just finished Lily's book. It comes out in December. Are you working on something else right now? Yes, actually, I am working on, um, I will have in May with um, Thule Publishing. I am working on a series with Shirley Jump, Kira Jacobs, and Susan Meyer. We, um, we have a series called Paradise Key. And it features four childhood friends who are reunited in this small beach town and where they wind up discovering our our tagline is love is better at the beach. And I will be book three in the Paradise Key series. Um, I share it's a reunion love story between Sophia Vargas and Nate Hamilton. And the title of the book is Resort to Love. So that's available in May by Tully, and then actually later this year, I'm really also 
blessed to be able to be participating. I will have a novella in um, Fern Michaels' Holiday Anthology. Oh, okay. And the, that, that book title is A Season to Celebrate, and it'll feature a novella by, obviously, Fern Michaels, Donna Kaufman, and Kate Pierce. And then I'll have one as well. And in my novella, it's titled Holiday Home Run. Readers will get to meet a Fernandez cousin. And um, Julia Fernandez will come to visit the sisters in Chicago over the holidays. And um, while she's there, Julia is an event planner. While she's there, she winds up finding her perfect match with an ex-baseball player named Ben Thomas. And so the title of that novella is Holiday Home Run. And that one I had a really fun time. I got to, I was listening to a lot of our Spanish uh, Christmas songs and I, I kind of dug, I, I got to pull out some of our Puerto Rican holiday traditions and, and sprinkle that in throughout the books. So that was a lot of, that novella was a lot of fun to write. And that one will be coming out in November. Okay. So you've got a lot of stuff coming up. That's exciting. It's a, yeah, it's a busy year. I'm super excited. Lots of good blessings. Yeah. So when we were chatting by email before the interview, you mentioned that you have um, a group on Facebook, excuse me, called the Four Chicas Chat Group. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Thank you so much for for asking about that. Um, I'll say Four Chicas Chat has come about. One thing I is that's amazing about the romance industry is the camaraderie and the support that you find amongst fellow authors. It's something I've experienced throughout my membership. As um, I'm a, I've been a longtime member of Romance Writers of America, and it's kind of what brought the four of us chicas together. And all four, we are Sabrina Soul, Alexis Daria, Mia Sosa, and myself. We're four um, Latina romance authors, so we write contemporary romance, and that's part of what ties us together. But what we decided to do is um, form together to create this Facebook group. And so it's a Facebook page for people who, who are writers or readers of romance or those who like to hang out with writers and readers of romance or those who like to have fun, lively conversations where we'll talk about our books, we'll talk about our lives, we might talk about something motivational or inspirational. Maybe we'll talk about a great movie that we're going to see. Really just a fun space to hang out. Um, our group is the number four, and then four chicas chat. And actually, we're kicking off on Monday, March 26th. We're having a casa warming, like a housewarming party from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern in the space. And then we will keep the doors to the house open, and we'll be posting. Hopefully, our members will, will post as well just motivational stuff, positive stuff, um, like I said, a, a space. Um, and a lot of authors have reader groups on Facebook. I'm, I'm lucky I'm also part of another one called Fiction from the Heart that has 12 of us there that, again, create a space for writers and readers and people to meet and, and talk about you know, things that are important to them. And so Fort Chica's Chat is, is along the same line. Yes, we'll talk a little bit about our Hispanic um, culture, but that's just one of the many things that we'll talk about in the Fort Chica chat space. Okay, thank you. So those uh, those groups are open. People can go and either like the page or join the group. Yep, if you if you like the group, I mean, I mean, join the group. Uh, um, I think it's we have it open to the public right now, and then just for a little bit of privacy for those who want to post things on Monday right before the casa warming. We'll make it private so that any pictures and things like that will stay within the Four Chicas chat group. Um, but all you have to do is click to join, and one of the four of us will approve you to come in and, and join the conversation. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. You mentioned earlier that you've kind of been writing um, for a long time, maybe your whole life. So is it something that you've always wanted to do? And uh, how did how did it kind of come about that you, you did finally start writing to be published? Well, I started writing maybe like short stories, short little romance stories in high school. I remember in the 11th grade when my teachers asked me if I thought about becoming a writer and went on to college and, and started majoring in English to be an English teacher. But the very first time I sat down to to write a book. I, I was married young. I was a military spouse. We had a we had a, a, a new baby and I had to take a semester off of college. I was still in my undergrad and I kind of, I had 
but was a long time romance reader. And during that semester, I realized that you know I needed to be working on something. I had been going to school full time and was a new mom, and so I needed something to fill that space. And that was when I first started putting my fingers to the electronic typewriter long before I had a had a laptop. And at that point, I'll be honest, I didn't know anything about Romance Writers America, about uh, um, the romance writing craft. I had a lot to learn, but it was, it's what started me on. And, you know, that was my, my oldest was a little one and, and now she's 27. So it was a long time ago. Um, I will say I, since then, I, I've written when I went whenever I could, but I've, you know, raised kids and gotten degrees and, and all that kind of stuff. Really, it wasn't until um, probably I started my MFA in um, at Seton Hill University that I was able to really focus and I would probably say like serious pursuit of romance writing. Um, by then, my, my kids were older. They, my youngest was a couple of years shy of going off to college, and so I had a little bit more time to focus on things you know, that I wanted to do, because while my, my kids were in the house, it was, um, I spent a lot of my time either doing things with them or volunteering, and, and then when you have a day job, you know, there are only 24 hours in the day, mm-hmm. so um, I, I say I've been writing a really long time, but seriously, probably just, you know, since maybe like 20, 2011. Okay. Do you have advice for other authors? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess. Uh, um, really, the two big things that I, I teach an online class called Romance Writing for Sun Gauge Learning or Ed to Go, and one of the things that we talk about, like in the in the very first lessons, are the importance of reading within our genre. You know, you can't really be a romance writer. I don't think you could be a horror writer um, if you're not well read, and if and if you don't, as yourself, have like reader expectations or understand what what other readers are are expecting. So read, 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 but also Right, 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 um, and I think yes, there's there's a there could be a lot of rejection um, as far as if you're seeking maybe tra- traditional publishing. Uh, um, when I first started out, that that was your your only avenue, and a lot of people say, well, it could be really lonely. You just, you know just writing by yourself in your laptop, and to that I say that the value of finding other other writers other authors, joining other organizations. And as a longtime member of Romance Writers of America, now I'm, I'm lucky to be on the national board. So obviously I'm a big proponent of RWA, but so much of what I have learned about our craft, about our industry business-wise, the majority of my writing mentors and friends have come from RWA or through um, Seton Hill and their uh, Seton Hill University and our writing popular fiction program. So the value of reading a lot within your genre, of honing your craft and, and taking lessons or going to presentations and, and, and practicing your craft, and the value of getting out there and, and meeting other authors to learn from them for, for you to teach them from what you've learned. Those are kind of like, for me, I would say that's the trifecta of how to keep on keeping on no matter what's going on, you know, in your life or, or in your professional career. Those three things. Okay. Thank you. You mentioned reading in your genre. So I assume that you probably read uh, quite a bit of romance. Who are your favorite Mm -hmm. authors when you, when you sit down to read for pleasure? Sure. Sure. Hands down, probably my number one favorite and, my one and two are Kristen Higgins and Suzanne Brockman. Um, I discovered Suzanne Brockman's Troubleshooter series years ago, and um, the one thing I love about that series is a similar thing I love about Kristen's is their characters are ones that come to life for me. And so they're on my keeper shelf because those characters, I feel like I know them, like they're my friends, and I want to I want to go spend time with them again, even though I may have already read their books. So Kristen Higgins and Suzanne Brockman, probably my one and two. Um, rounding out my top five would be people like Sonali Dev, Beverly Jenkins, Salgani Kathari, and, and, and Alyssa Cole. Um, those are, they're just 
powerhouses in the romance genre, um, and so I can't recommend their books enough. I think going in, going. I mean, you could go on and on because obviously I feel there's so many amazing authors in our in our industry. I would obviously recommend any of the four chicas, so Sabrina or Alexis or Mia, as well as any of the other 11 authors that are in the fiction from the heart. Um, we have some authors in there that have published 60 books. When you look at someone like Barbara Samuel, she's, she's in the fiction from the heart. But that group of, I, I feel very lucky to be a part of that group because of the mentorship. If I have questions, they're, they're willing to answer. Um, they're, it's a good support system. So if anybody's looking for a book for this week, if you're heading off on spring break or if you're listening to this a little bit later and you're looking for a book for the weekend, I would recommend any of the Fiction from the Heart authors, any of the Four Chica Chats, or any of the other ones that, that I've just listed. You won't be disappointed. Perfect. Thank you. Where can people, and it sounds like uh, quite a few places, where can people find you on the internet and social media? Sure. I would love for you to come find me. <laughs> um, I have my website. I will say my first name, Priscilla, is one that is often misspelled. So on my website, on Facebook, on Instagram, and Twitter, you'll find me as Pris, P-R-I-S, Oliveras. That way there's, there's no misspelling. But I, I have my official website, and then I'm fairly active on Twitter, probably sometimes too much. I need to make sure I put my phone on do not disturb when it's time for me to start writing because I can really dive into the social media distraction. But on Twitter and Instagram as Pris Oliveras, and I have my personal um, author Facebook page, but also I'm hanging out. Like this week, I am the house host for Fiction from the Heart, and uh, this week then we're also kicking off the four Chica's Chats. So on Facebook, you can find me in any of those three places, either my personal author page or either one of those two author groups. Okay. Thank you for that. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you would like people to know about writing, about your books, about just really anything that we haven't covered? Okay, gosh, that's that's like a big question. Yes, it is. (laughs) And I'm a big talker. (laughs) There are times where I hang up and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, did I ramble too much? (laughs) I guess really just um, with with my books, some people have asked me, is there, you know, how much of the Latino or uh, um, like with the Spanish am I going to understand? And uh, um, my tagline is sweet contemporary romance with a Latinx flavor. So I would just say really with my books, if you decide to spend some time with Yasmin and Thomas or with Rosa and Jeremy or any of the other ones that come later, uh, uh, they're, they're written with a lot of heart and a little bit of Latino flavor and a lot of love for my characters. And, and my only hope is that when you get to the end and you've spent some time with them, that you've fallen in love with them as, as, as much as I have and, and you enjoyed time well spent. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me about um, your series, Matched to Perfection, as well as a couple of other upcoming things that you have. I really appreciate the time that you spent with me. Oh, no, this has been a great opportunity. It was fun chatting. I look forward to maybe doing it again. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Once again, a huge thank you to my guest, Priscilla Oliveras, for taking the time out of her day, especially a day where she ended up talking to me in a noisy place because she had other things scheduled, and yet she kept the interview with me. So thank you so much, Priscilla, for doing that. I really appreciate it. And I actually took her away from her mom. She was having uh, some time with her mom and she took time out uh, from spending time with her mom to talk to uh, me about her book so that you, my listeners, could hear about this series and this book. So thank you, Priscilla's mom. I don't know her first name. I apologize for uh, sharing your daughter with me and with the GSMC Book Review podcast listening world. I really appreciate it. 
So thank you to Priscilla. Thank you to Priscilla's mom. Thank you to you, my listeners, for tuning in. I hope you will join me again on Tuesday for a new episode. And I don't have an author interview scheduled for this weekend. It's Easter. And so I decided to not make any of my potential authors take time out of what could be a holiday weekend for them uh, to do an interview. So no interviews this weekend, which is very different for me. But on Tuesday, I will be having an episode with um, co-host Stacy, who is new to the podcast world. And she is, she's an even bigger book geek, lover, nerd, whatever you want to put in there. Um, whatever word, I, I can't even think of a word that's big enough. You know, she has a passion for books. She's even more of a book person than I am, I think. So it is so much fun to talk to Stacy. And we sat down recently to just talk about books in general and Harry Potter specifically. There's a lot of giggling and a lot of book talk. So please join us on Tuesday as Stacy and I talk about Harry Potter and giggle and enjoy being literary book nerds together. It's awesome. In the meantime, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can download those podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, any app that you use for your mobile device, device anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find us and you can follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. We have a blog, GSMC blogs, GSMC book review blogspot com. All of the author, all the author information for the authors that I interview is on that blog. Their websites, their social media feeds, etc. Don't forget, we still have giveaways going. If you want a copy of Jim Heskett's Nail Gun Messiah from Tuesday's interview, you can go on a social media and um, and enter into those giveaways. So check those out, please. Uh, who doesn't love free books? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe you do. Lo maybe you maybe you don't love free books. In which case, you know, you don't you don't want to go to the giveaway. But free books are awesome, and you definitely want to go and sign up for the giveaways. Do it. It'll be fun. That's enough out of me. I am going to say goodbye for now, and I'll see you on Tuesday. In the meantime, enjoy your Easter weekend and spend part of it getting lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast part of the golden state media concepts podcast network you can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com download our podcast on itunes stitcher soundcloud and google play just type in gsmc to find all the shows from the golden state media concepts podcast network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can and also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.